Hello there, and welcome to session one in what's going to be a four-part mindfulness series. This series is designed by Prepped in partnership with the Wise Mind Company. And really what inspired this session is to empower you with practical tools and skills to help you navigate this rather challenging and uncertain time with greater ease and well-being. Um, the good news is that the skills and practices that we're going to be sharing with you throughout these sessions are also the same skills that help strengthen our leadership and our professional effectiveness. So if you ask us, it's a great return on investment of your time and energy. Um, today, we're going to be exploring the hidden power of positive emotions. And in particular, how positive emotions help us build resilience and navigate uncertainty. I just want to begin by introducing myself and my colleague, Liz Berholt, who you can see in the video as well. So my name is Ashley Frankel, and I'm co-founder, along with Liz Berholt, of the Wise Mind Company. We are a global consulting and development firm that really, we say, was built on burnout. So Liz and I started our professional lives in banking for Liz and law for me. And our experience in those worlds really inspired us to, to create a company, an organization that works to build well work cultures and also empowers people with soft skills for strengthened leadership and sustainable well being. So we often joke that we're hardcore about soft skills. Um, all of our work is evidence based work, and so it's informed by positive psychology, mindfulness, and neuroscience. And so you're going to hear us making reference to those um, areas of study uh, throughout this presentation today. Just by way of housekeeping before we get into the content, I love seeing people saying hello to each other and to us. It's such a nice way of feeling connection. And so I wanted to just let you know that there are going to be a few opportunities for connection just to engage with one another through. We have one poll and some questions we want to put out to you. And we really want to encourage you to share because sharing really helps us all learn from each other, right? We have as much to learn from each of you as you have to learn from us. Um, and also we're going to, time permitting, we're going to do some Q&A at the end. So that's our hope. And so I just want to encourage you also to put any questions in the chat box. And Liz is going to be managing that chat box for us. Um, and so we'll make sure that we get to as many questions as we can at the end. What are we going to cover today? So some, we like to know where we're going to go. The mind is always anticipating. So let's put ourselves at ease. We're going to start off by exploring the power of positive emotions and in particular look at how do positive emotions build resilience. Then I'm going to share with you this interesting positivity ratio, which answers the question, how much positivity do we need to flourish? And then we're going to get to tipping the scales towards that positivity ratio and um, look at five evidence-based practices to power up positive emotions. Well, I'm really excited to get started with you. Um, as a as a recovering lawyer, I was very well trained in identifying what's wrong and all of sort of the negative things because we're in risk management. So learning to build my um, ability to notice the positive has been a real practice for me. But I can tell you from personal experience, it's been it's paid off in dividends. Um, I, I I just. I want to start off by acknowledging that it that it may seem trivial at first to be focusing on positive emotions in the face of this pandemic and this crucible moment that we're in, this really challenging times that we're facing, um, whether it's to you know our health, maybe the health of our loved ones, our own financial stability, um, a change to our job circumstances. Um, but there are a whole bunch of really positive um, positive emotions that really matter especially when we're facing adversity. So, um, you know, as Barbara Fredrickson says, she's one of the leading researchers in this space, and we're going to get into her work in a minute, but positive emotions are, are really, they're not luxuries, but instead they might be critical necessities for optimal functioning, and this is what we want to talk about today. What are some of those positive emotions? So it's interesting, because we don't tend to, to pay so much attention to positive emotions, um, 
it can actually be hard to call some of them up. So I'm just sharing with you, it's not a complete list, of course, and you can think of some others um, on your own, but these are some of the positive emotions that have been really deeply studied in positive psychology. Joy, gratitude, love, interest, hope, pride, and delight. And so I just want to invite you, you know, while we're here and moving into the rest of the presentation, to even just think about when is the last time you felt one of these emotions and going a little deeper to just notice for yourself what triggered that what triggered love or gratitude or joy and how did it feel to feel it what other positive emotions came from it where were you who was involved right so just starting to really mine and pay attention to that experience and if you are in a situation where you haven't felt any of these positive emotions in a while i just want to say that's okay too I want to invite you to meet yourself with compassion and kindness and know that by the end of this session, you're going to have some practical tools for boosting those positive emotions. So what good are these positive emotions apart from the fact that they feel good? What is the point of feeling happy or joyful, grateful or delightful? What we know from the research is that positive emotions have a long lasting effect on our personal growth and our resilience. In fact, Barbara Fredrickson's work shows us that they fundamentally change the way the human brain works, which is just so fascinating to me. So they change the way the human brain is functioning in the moment. So when we're feeling the positive emotions, that's like a short term impact. They also change the way the brain is structured in the long term. So as I mentioned, the person behind this realization is Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, who has devoted her entire career to researching the power of positive emotions. According to her, all positive emotions share two core truths, okay? So this is the, the basis of her, what she calls her broaden and build theory. So the first piece is that they open us up. Okay, so positive emotions, and that's that broadening. They broaden perspective and they broaden possibility. So you might imagine, you know, the dandelions that are everywhere, at least where I live. At night in the dark, they close up, but with the sunlight in the morning, they open up and expand. So Barbara Fredrickson often uses this flower analogy to say that positive emotions, you might think of them as like the sunlight. They warm our hearts and our minds and they open us up. Uh, this opening up is a temporary effect. So it happens. How long does this positive thinking last? So Christine, I see your question. I'm actually going to answer that right now in a way. Um, these are the temporary effects. So this broadening, so they happen in relationship to the feelings, the positive emotions, and it lasts sort of short lived after that positive emotion. But what happens is it triggers us to see the bigger picture and these larger systems that are at play. In other words, we see the forest through the trees. And why is this important? Because what they've found is that this wider awareness leads to helping us see more possibilities in any given situation, presents ourselves with more options for what next right step to take, and really helps us um, access our highest order thinking and so our really sharpest problem solving skills and something that we call response flexibility. So that flexible, agile thinking that's so intimately connected to resilience. Um, we also access greater creativity and it fosters greater collaboration as well, which is really interesting. Research has also found that when we ex uh, open up, when we broaden through positive emotions, there's a direct relationship to improved performance. So I just wanna point to something that might be relevant for you and you may already be making this connection, but it can be really powerful to um, bring to mind something that evokes positive emotions for yourself before something that might be stressful. So like a, a job interview um, or a networking opportunity, if you, like me, find those to be stress-inducing events, by calling up a positive emotion before you head into them, you can really prime your mind and your heart to really show up the best of yourself. The second truth is that they transform us for the better. So this is the piece that relates to building resources, and this is the enduring part. So far from the momentary effect that I just talked about, positive emotions have been shown to build really important physical, intellectual, 
social and psychological resources. So basically impacting all aspects of our well-being in a way that is enduring. Okay, so the positive emotions themselves are micro moments. They're small and incremental, but they build in predictable and permanent ways. So we can experience structural changes in the brain over time that strengthen our executive function. So the way we make decisions and we reason, increasing feelings of connection and trust. We've seen in the studies that it increases a sense of self-acceptance a greater sense of purpose, meaning, and fulfillment, which are all directly related to resilience. It's also worth noting, especially given that we're in a, a, a time of kind of prolonged stress, that positive emotions help us strengthen our stress recovery. So what we've found is that um, positive emotions reduce the physiological impacts of stress and actually trigger our parasympathetic nervous system, which is our relaxation response in our body. Uh, Barbara Fredrickson talks about uh, positive emotions as nutrients, like fruits and vegetables for the body, that they nourish our minds and our hearts. And over time, if we feed ourselves these nutrients on a daily basis, what happens is positive states, so those momentary experiences, can become positive traits that are enduring and part of our character. So how much positivity do we need? I love this. Um, because so Dr. Barbara Fredrickson really wanted to know, kind of like knowing the temperature ice will turn into water, the tipping point being 32 degrees Fahrenheit. She was curious about what ratio of positive emotions to negative emotions would tip a person from languishing to flourishing. And what she's found is that that tipping point is three heartfelt positive emotions to every one heart-wrenching negative emotion that we endure. And this is what will seed our resilient thriving or our flourishing. So it's interesting to look at it over the course of each day, but it's more relevant when we start looking at it over the courses of the month or even over the years of our lives. And most of us, the research shows, are really at a ratio of two to one. So it seems like there's room to improve for most of us an opportunity of growth for growth for us here. I think what's interesting about this, what I want to point out, is that the ratio is not three to zero. Okay, what this means is that this is wide enough to encompass the full range of human emotions and the human experience. This is not about eliminating negative emotions. Negative emotions are critically important. They help us survive. They alert us to when something is wrong. Experiencing and expressing negative emotions in healthy ways is a key part to our flourishing, okay? So I just wanna drive this point home that we are not talking about toxic positivity culture, which does sweep through social media actually quite a bit. You know those messages that you see high vibes only or be positive? Um, while well-intentioned, they can actually have the opposite effect of what we're talking about here. We're not looking to force anything or to put on a mask of being happy all the time. This actually leads us to a place of insincerity and, and where we're not being genuine. So what we're looking at here is how do we cultivate heartfelt, genuine, positive emotions? And it's important before we move into the practices to understand a piece about negative emotions and experiences and positive emotions and experiences and how the brain actually experiences them. So um, Rick Hansen is a, his name is hiding here in the slide I noticed, but he is a neuropsychologist who's done a lot of work as well around the brain and positive experiences and emotions. And uh, what he's noticed is that he says the brain is like Velcro for negative experiences, but Teflon for positive ones. We tend to notice the negative more. So the brain has what's called a negativity bias. And so it's not you. It's the way the brain has evolved over time. And it tends to not notice the positive as much. But what we know is that we're actually experiencing positive emotions more frequently than negative ones. So Barbara Fredrickson says, it's like negative emotions scream at us and positive emotions 
whisper. The key here is to start to cultivate some habits of mind and practices to help us turn the volume up on those positive experiences and emotions that we're already having every day, but we're not noticing. So that when we turn the volume up on them, we actually get the benefit of them from a perspective of resilience and well-being, right? And start to broaden and build. It's kind of like, it, you know, having the fruits and vegetables in your fridge, but you actually have to eat them in order for them to have an impact. So we're going to look at how do we start digesting these positive experiences that we have every day so that we can take them and get that benefit of the positive emotions. So let's share five practices to power up positive emotions. These are all evidence-based practices. They're simple, but because of what I just talked about, about the brain and the negativity bias, they're not necessarily easy. So they do take practice. Um, it's kind of like changing any other habit, right? It takes work. But what I can tell you from my own personal experience is this is well worth the investment. So our first two practices really focus on this idea of helping us become aware of the good in our lives, turning up the volume on these experiences that otherwise go unnoticed or sort of just slip off. So the practice of gratitude and the practice of hunting the good stuff. And I'm just curious here, how many of you have a gratitude practice? So this is our one and only poll. But gratitude's really been something, I mean, Oprah's been talking about it for years, uh, but science has, is now supporting what Oprah says about gratitude, which is that there are some real significant and enduring benefits. Well, I've never used this poll feature. It's amazing. It's coming up so fast. So I see that actually a large, it's still calculating, but a fairly significant percentage of you have a gratitude practice. I'm going to share two practices that are well researched and supported, but I also want to invite you in the chat box to share with each other what your gratitude practice looks like, because there's no one way to do this. And we can really inspire each other by sharing the different ways that we're inviting gratitude into our lives. So one of the simplest ways is a gratitude journal. And I'm curious to know if anybody is going to share that that's a practice. Um, gratitude journaling or just making a gratitude list is really simple. It's about inviting in on a daily basis the intention of noticing three things that you're grateful for, and then to really deepen or marinate into that, to start to call up those, to, to shift it from thinking about what you're grateful for, the key is to move into feeling what you're grateful for. And one powerful way to do that is to then ask yourself, how or why does this person or experience or thing make me feel grateful? What am I thankful for about it? So digging a little deeper. So what am I grateful for and why? And just listing three things a day. Another really powerful practice is what Dr. Robert Emmons refers to as the two minute miracle. So he's one of the leading researchers in the science of gratitude. And the two minute miracle is really about um, uh, maximizing our gratitude experience by sharing it with someone else. And so just inviting you to think about someone you're grateful for, perhaps someone you've overlooked thanking, and share with them either, I mean, it's most effective in person, although that's harder these days, share with them what it is you're grateful for about them. So not just saying thank you or I'm grateful for you, but going further, and it's two-minute miracle because he encourages you to take two full minutes to explain to that person what it is about them that you're thankful for. So these days with social distancing, it might be easier to do it by way of a phone call, or even if you're more comfortable in writing, sharing an email with somebody. Um, but what we know here is that this helps induce positive emotions in the person you're sharing it with. It also fosters a real sense of connection in the relationship, which in a minute you're gonna see is another core practice is connection and it boosts your own positive emotions. The, um, Liz, are there any, any shared gratitude practices in the chat? Just curious. Yeah, so there are um, lots of them actually, which is wonderful. So 
writing three things that they're grateful for every night before sleep. Um, and uh, expressing gratitude every day. So, you know, that some of them are quite simple. And, you know, starting out, that can be really helpful. There is a question, should it be three different things every day? Mm, interesting. Um, I would say just meet yourself where you are. So if you're beginning this practice, if it's the same thing every day, absolutely fine. Um, just trusting that over time, it gets easier and easier to start to identify the things we're grateful for. So at first you might feel a bit stumped or maybe you're gonna notice sort of the more obvious things like a roof over your head and food on the table. But as you come to this practice every day, it gets richer and richer I find. And we start to surprise ourselves every so often with some of the things that come up. I also like to encourage people since you asked to, to sometimes try to include something about themselves that they're grateful for. Really like an appreciation about yourself um, if you're up for that challenge. So just to share as well, there are some people talking about sharing it with their families at dinner. So that's a really wonderful practice as well that I know, Ashley, I've heard you speak about too. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, integrating it into family uh, experiences also helps me keep the habit up, right? So we've made it part of our dinner routine with the kids, and that just helps hold me accountable. Um, I just want to encourage you to read through the list. We can't go through them all, but inspire yourself by reading what some of your peers have shared. The second practice is similar. This is about hunting the good stuff. Hunting the good stuff comes from the research out of the University of Pennsylvania. And this is just about because we know that we tend to notice the negative, even though there's actually more positive around us, we just want to start to create habits that help us tune into the positive. So I'm going to name a few here that are research backed. One is to start counting kindness throughout the day. And while we're in a really challenging spot right now, there's also so much kindness happening around us, right? There's tons of beautiful grassroots initiatives that are springing up. And even that practice that's happening in Toronto, I've heard, although I'm not living there right now, but at, you know, seven o'clock at night, people rooting and cheering for the, the frontline workers, which actually brings up emotion in me even right now. Um, so just starting to play this game with yourself of counting the kindness, both that you're giving each day and you're receiving. Another great practice by the father of positive psychology, Martin Seligman, is to ask yourself at the end of the day what went well today. This is just a way of counterbalancing our tendency of ruminating over all the things that didn't go right. Okay, so just challenging your mind. And our mind is particularly susceptible or receptive in the evenings before bed. So feed it those nutrients of positivity and just notice the impact it has not only on your sleep, but also, again, that enduring quality of resilience. And another one that I love is keeping an I've accomplished list. And that really is to sit beside your never ending to do list, encouraging you at the end of your day to build in this habit of just celebrating the things you've accomplished. And it doesn't have to be many. You know, on any, some days we've accomplished getting out of bed. And if we're actually living with a lot of anxiety, for example, at this particular moment, then that one thing is really worth celebrating. Getting out of bed is worth celebrating, but it can really be easy to overlook those things when we're fixated on all the things that we wish we were doing that we aren't. This next practice is called savoring. Um, really what savoring does, so we talked about our default is to let the good slide off. So Rick Hansen, who I quoted before, the neuropsychologist, has done a lot of work in this area. And what he's found is that if we can hold on to uh, a positive experience for 20 seconds, it's long enough to create those positive structural changes in the brain. So this is a practice that's really helping us build. You know, there's the broaden and the build components of Dr. Fredrickson's theory, and this helps build those enduring resources. It's really like helping the positive experiences stick like Velcro. Um, so what is savoring? Savoring is really just the act of stepping into an experience more fully. It's a mindfulness practice. It's about being able to be in and appreciate and really feel whatever positive experience we're having. So often we can be, for example, if walking in nature is a positive experience for you, you can be walking in nature, but your mind is off ruminating and worrying about the future. So you're not actually getting or deriving the benefit of the experience. To, so to savor, you just want to think about bringing yourself fully into the moment, engaging your senses in the moment, being present with your experience. 
You can also savor past experiences. And I'm going to invite us just to briefly do a, a savoring of a joyful experience. What you do to savor a past experience is you just call it up. You want to bring to memory an experience that has been positive for you. So even right now, I just want to ask you all and sharing it in the chat, because we know that one of the ways to actually enhance savoring is to share it with others. So I want you to think about something that brought you joy in the last day or two. And then just enhance that savoring experience by sharing it with others in the chat. And you can read through them and notice for yourself if there's any consistencies. You might also notice that the things that bring us joy are very individual. And if nothing's brought you joy in the last couple of days, then really looking back even further. I just want you to notice how easy it is, but actually how impactful it can be. So just start to think about who was there, what were the sounds, the smells, the sensations around you when that moment of joy arose for you, recreating those positive emotions that you felt. I love joy because joy is not dependent on circumstances, right? I always say joy is available to us in any given moment if we bring presence and curiosity and awe to an experience. So maybe just thinking of it that way. And then we can enhance savoring by, as I said, sharing our experiences, thinking about how lucky we are in the moment, uh, sometimes taking a photo of the activity so you can savor it again later, limiting distractions, writing about it, identifying and naming positive emotions you're feeling has a really great way of deepening us into our experience. So just those are just some practices that have been effective ways of enhancing the savoring. Our last two practices focus on our interconnectedness. Interconnection is foundational to our flourishing. They're pretty self-explanatory, but the first practice is this idea of generosity of spirit. And the quote says it all. There is no exercise better for the heart than reaching down and lifting people up. Just want to invite you to think about how can I be generous today? And generosity is not just with our money, it's with our time, our energy, our knowledge, our insight, and even our presence, right? I mean, that is so rare these days to give our full attention and presence. So just the way you show up for people can be an act of generosity. Um, Benjamin Franklin would always ask himself in the morning, what good shall I do today? And that's a really simple way of sort of um, putting the coordinates into your GPS to lead you towards generosity and being of service. And the last practice is connection. Uh, connection is essential for flourishing. So I know that the way that we connect with people has been challenged, um, but there's also been opportunities over the last number of weeks, in part because I think we can fool ourselves into thinking that being around people like we were before in close proximity, socializing means that we're connecting, but actually there's a difference. For the connection to be one that impacts our well-being and our positive emotions, we really need the connection to be genuine. It needs to um, be authentic. And so we really have this opportunity now to think about how can I cultivate genuine, deep, authentic connection? We can think about connection to ourselves. We can think about connection to others and even to nature. So one example I wanna give that I think might resonate with you relates to networking. Networking could be about building contacts. But with a few simple changes, it can actually be an experience that's really about cultivating connection. And the difference is just asking yourself, how can I fully show up in this moment? How can I share who I really am in this moment? What's most important to me here? How can I bring my full presence and attention to this? What's the opportunity in this moment? So really thinking in any given moment, how can I make this more memorable? How can I make this connection meaningful? Uh, it really gives you that opportunity to create that deeper sense of connection that supports our well-being. And as we conclude, sort of most importantly, I love this quote. She's, Barbara Fredrickson says, you need to pivot away from what's worked for others toward what's worked for you. Discover for yourself what rouses genuine, heartfelt positivity. So just in summary, what we're looking for here is micro moments every day of tapping into positive emotions knowing that positive experiences are available to us all day, all the time. 
hopefully we can just start to build in some of these practices that help us cultivate these micro moments that over time begin to build this enduring shift and build this um, well of well-being and resilience that then we can tap into when we need it, when things get difficult. So I just encourage you to think about it like this. It's more about creating a mindset of positivity, asking ourselves, who am I being in any moment? Be grateful. Be grateful. Be open. Be both curious. Curious. Be authentic. Be authentic. And be you. Be you. And by being by those being things, those, those mindsets those of positivity, the positive emotions are going to flow all on their own. So with that, um, I want to invite you. We've covered a lot. And I always love to conclude with asking people to share. What is one thing you're taking away with you today? It's a really beautiful way of rooting the learning and also sharing with each other, you know, what's really resonated for you. So I just want to open up that chat again, and hopefully you'll populate it with the one key learning that you're taking away with you today. I also, we are at the 30 minute mark, but I do want to let you know that we're going to stick around for a few minutes to answer some questions. So if you have any questions, we want to invite you to drop them in. And Liz will select a couple of questions um, that we're going to answer for you today. I've also included my phone number and my email address. We see these micro sessions as just the beginning, you know, planting seeds. And so I want to invite you to reach out directly if you have any questions, you want additional resources or support. We're always here. Okay, we're about sustainable change, and that means that we're here to help you from this point forward in any way we can. So Liz, I'm just gonna turn it over to you, uh, maybe to just quickly read through if there's any shares on what they're taking away and um, a couple of questions if we have any. Which is a great question for the time right now is how do we keep positive without becoming detached from reality? Mm, what a beautiful question. Um, and this is a big question. This is one we could have quite a long conversation around. I think what's really important is the practice of mindfulness is very helpful. Mindfulness is about tuning in and just being present with what's here for us. And I think that that is really helpful because then you start to, to know the truth of what's here in that moment, right? So noticing with curiosity, with non-judgment, with presence, how am I feeling? And, and then being able to be there with whatever's there so that we're not forcing anything else. You know, I think the most important piece first is to acknowledge whatever feelings are present for us, to acknowledge our current reality, what el whatever that means, right? And then also know that we can be at the same time building in these micro habits to help build this, um, these positivities, enduring traits of positivity that just help us navigate through these times of change. But so I would say the, the, the greatest way to stay with what's real is actually to practice mindfulness and coming into the present moment. Because what we tend to do is live in the past or the future, and we are quite detached from what's happening right now. We're more involved in the stories we're spinning. And so by meditating every day or just checking in with yourself, taking a few seconds to notice, how's my body feeling? How am I feeling today? And then instead of judging ourselves and pushing those feelings down, actually embracing them, being curious about them, giving them full permission to be here is really important. Great question. Um, why do we give up on this? Why do we forget how to do this and not sustain it for long? Mm, that's what I ask myself about running and eating healthy <laughs> and turning the TV off before bed, uh, like long before bed, because um, creating new habits is hard. And, and I want you to know it's also not just you, right? These, this is why we call them practices, because they take practice. It takes time. And we want to be compassionate with ourselves. Um, part of the reason with these practices that it's particularly challenging is because of our biology, you know, and I, I don't have time to go into all of it right now. But as I had mentioned briefly, the brain is an old brain that we have. And for survival purposes, 
it needed back in the cave days to notice the threats were to our survival. So it had to notice the negative. It had to notice the dangers. That was important for our survival. And so we have this brain, but now more recent science says to us, well, we can do mind fitness. We can actually change this brain, which they didn't think we could do not that long ago. And so part of it is that we're really trying to, um, it, there's, it's biology. So it's not easy. We're working hard to create these new neural pathways. And that's why I say small micro, micro moments make a difference. And be compassionate with yourself when you fall off. And just invite yourself back on and begin again, as we say in mindfulness. How do we implement this with, with uh, other people, with kids? How does it influence them? How can we have an impact on maybe their practice of those uh, uh, positive emotions? Oh, I love this question. Um, we could do a whole session on this, and, um, and we have, Liz and I, actually. One of the things that I would say is, first of all, when we lead ourselves this way, we automatically impact those around us, okay? So that's the first thing. If you work on it yourself, you're going to naturally impact those around you. We see that in mindfulness practice within organizations and studies that have studied it between parents and children. Um, but one of the other things we can do is, you know that question I offered you, what went well today? You know, or other questions that similarly direct us towards the positive, we can start asking those in our relationships. We can ask our peers, our colleagues, our children, what went well today? You know, how often do we say to our kids, what's wrong? But when have you ever said, hey, what's right? So by simply shifting the questions we're asking, we can start to, if you think of those questions as the coordinates on the GPS, and whatever questions we ask help determine where we end up, you can help determine where they end up by the questions you ask them. So that's just another simple thing. And then as I mentioned earlier, like our gratitude practice at home, try to build it into some of your daily routines, like your dinner or your bedtime routine. Um, or if you're having, if you're working right now and you're on a team, try opening your team meetings with a question like, what have you accomplished today? Or what went well this week? And you'll start to see how it begins to snowball. Maybe one more question before we, if there is any, if there's another question there. It's um, really about the skill, I think, of, of when things are really hard, how do we how do we then use these practices when they're, everything seems to be going wrong? Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to acknowledge uh, the courage of the question, first of all. And, and, and to say that we don't have to be doing this all the time. Okay, so there are moments where we just need to be in what's difficult. And that as I mentioned earlier, learning how to be with negative experiences and the really uncomfortable feelings that arise is as essential to our flourishing and our resilience as cultivating positive emotions. So acknowledging the first thing is to really dedicate the time and energy to allowing yourself, not fighting or pushing away those experiences that are difficult, but but it's a whole other set of tools. And actually next week session is about unwinding the anxious mind and managing some of those difficult emotions. So please join us for that one. Um, but, I, but I think it's first about embracing and learning some of these mindfulness practices that help us accept those experiences. Because when we do do that, they do tend to flow through us more easily. And remembering that um, these little micro moments of positivity can coexist in the challenges, even if it's just in the questions we ask ourselves about the difficult moment. So you see, I want to show you just how small these moments can be. So you can be going through something really difficult, and maybe your gratitude practice has fallen off, and you're not appreciating the birds chirping outside because you're really consumed with, you know, when you're going to see a paycheck so you can pay the rent on your apartment. You know, I understand that. That's very real, and it is consuming. I was consumed in rumination last night on a walk with my kids, worrying about a deadline that was stressing me out, right? And we don't, it almost blinds us. Like we don't even see the beauty around us. 
part of it is accepting that that's okay, but also that we can practice these positive um, mindsets, even in that difficulty. So for example, asking yourself, what's possible, right? That's like a really, that generates a feeling of hope and control and possibility and a bunch of really beautiful positive emotions whilst not even asking you to step out of the difficult experience, right? So I think what's important is being compassionate with ourselves about this and remembering that these practices are going to look different at different times. And I hope that was helpful. And please, if you want to have a more expansive conversation about this, because I think it's really important, uh, please reach out to us. I'm, I'm happy to, to dive deeper into this with you. So Liz, if there's, um, maybe we'll wrap it up here. We're at 40 minutes. Um, I just wanted to say um, thank you to everyone for joining us. Sorry, I fumbled there because there was some feedback. I wasn't sure if this, someone was going to chime in with anything. Um, thank you again for being here. And, you know, thanking yourself for taking the time to show up today and invest in yourself. Like this is a great act of self-care just being here. And I really hope that you remind yourselves that you don't have to do all of this. You know, just asking yourself, what is one thing that I can take with me and try is progress. And practice makes progress, right? We're not looking for perfection, though I'm still working on that part. Okay, so we hope to see you back here next week for session two in our series where we're going to be talking about how to unwind our anxious mind. Um, in the meantime, be well and take care of yourselves. Thank you.